euthanasia has long been one of the most controversial topics amongst the medical community, lawmakers, and the general public. While some see it as an act of humanity to allow a patient to die on their own terms, others see it as an ethical crime. No matter what, everyone seems to have an opinion. All this debate prompts the question, should euthanasia be legal in the United States? We believe, yes, euthanasia should be legal in the United States due to its historical precedent and public support. All of this controversy seems inconsequential without a clear definition of what is euthanasia. According to Medical News Today, it's a deliberate action taken with the intention of ending a life to relieve persistent pain. This quote actually oversimplifies euthanasia, so I'll give a quick rundown of what it actually is. There are two major types, passive and active. Passive euthanasia is when life-sustaining care is withdrawn and the patient dies of natural causes. While active euthanasia is when lethal substance is administered to a patient either by themselves or through a medical practitioner, which causes the patient to die. According to a study conducted by Anna Worthington and her colleagues, it was determined that the most common drugs used in active euthanasia were benzodiazepines, sedatives, opioids, and high-dose barbiturates. First, the medical practitioner would administer a general anesthetic, which would cause a patient to lose consciousness. Then, um, then they would be administered um, a neuromuscular blocking agent, which would cause the patient to be paralyzed so that they wouldn't be a harm to themselves and their family wouldn't be disturbed if they saw them moving around after they had died. Euthanasia is actually a very painless and safe procedure. But why would a patient choose to die this way? There are many reasons why, but according to an article in the New York Times written by Jane Brody, it is less of a question of uncontrollable physical pain which only prompts a minority of requests for medical aid in dying, then it is a loss of autonomy, a loss of dignity, a loss of quality of life, and an inability to engage in what makes people's lives meaningful. Whether you agree with medical euthanasia or not, it is part of the larger conversation that has spanned centuries, which Gage will discuss in the historical political lens. When we talk about the historical political lens surrounding euthanasia, so euthanasia started in the 5th century BC in ancient Greece where the Greeks and Romans tended to support euthanasia and it's continued to the present where the most recent legislation of euthanasia was passed in May of 2023. This timeline is important to understand because although it has banned over centuries, it is still an uh, interesting and important topic in today's discussions. In 2000, the Maine Death Dignity Act was defeated on a margin of 51 to 49. Just one year later, the entire country of the Netherlands passed official legislation to make euthanasia legal in the country. This is important to understand because despite it only being one year's difference, an entire country was able to pass euthanasia and make it legal, while one state being Maine was unable to pass it just one year before. So some statistics surrounding euthanasia are all adults, there's a 72% of adults support euthanasia in the United States. This can bring up a couple questions. If 72% of adults support euthanasia, then why is it not legalized? And maybe if it's not legalized because of that, it might come down to the political parties that people represent. Well, as you can see in the below statistics as well, there's a 62% of Republicans that support euthanasia and 80% of Democrats support euthanasia. Well, this is also interesting because if you believe that these could be interesting indicators of whether or not it would be legalized or not, you can see that even though they both support it, it is still not legalized, which might bring up the question, then why is it not legalized still? Well, the reason it is not legalized is because of the big corporations that have banded together to stop and oppose the legalization of euthanasia. One of these examples is the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund. I'm going to be passing it on to Reagan to talk about the social cultural lines. All right, so we wanted to take into account the um, association of euthanasia in nursing homes and settings with primarily elderly people suffering um, with pain or incurable diseases like Alzheimer's and dementia. Topics such as public opinion, 
dignity, social and cultural differences and belief all take precedence when deciding whether this painless procedure should be allowed worldwide. There are three topics I wanted to cover on the social and cultural lens, those being social versus biological death, palliative care, and religion and culture. Social death is the idea that someone suffering from terminal or life-ending illness is pushed away from society and caused them to be treated as non-existent or dead. People who um, suffer from social death um, don't have the support needed around them to care or want to live. People suffering with AIDS um, suffer from social death because they're seen as possibly contagious or dirty, even though we do have um, more educated beliefs in this disease, there's still a large stigmatism around them. This stigma is what causes social death versus biological death. Sage Journal states that there's a series associated with social death and its process, loss of identity, loss of the ability to take part in daily activity, and loss in social relationships. Social death takes a large toll on the people experiencing the disease and the reaction to those around them also cause them to feel rejected and unappreciated, which would bring me a number of people who are suffering from those diseases to want to go through with euthanasia or assisted suicide. A way to decrease these numbers is palliative care. Palliative care is important in the end of life setting because it allows individuals to have the ability and support they're needed to help them understand what's happening to them in the end of life process. Palliative care allows for social death to coincide with biological death and allows the patient to overcome the idea of euthanasia or death to be less of something that is that they want and more of a process that's actually happening to them at its own pace. My final topic is religion and culture. Religion and culture play a role in determining how to deal with patients requesting suicide, assisted suicide, or euthanasia, because as rates of euthanasia and other assisted suicide methods rise, rates of Christianity are also dropping. Perkins states that support is widely shown through those in non-religious or higher educated communities. Groups following religion do state that primarily God, in some ways, does determine when somebody should die. But overall, in the end, it is up to the person suffering from that long-term illness to decide whether or not they want to go through with euthanasia and the assisted suicide method and terminate their life or not. Next, Mandy will be talking about the ethical stance. Because people cannot currently use euthanasia freely, those who may have valid reasons for seeking this option are prevented from making their own choices. Some examples of reasons people may want to use euthanasia include include chronic illness, constant undergoing of treatment, and overall long-term suffering that will eventually lead to death. So this is where freedom of choice comes in. People argue that individuals should have the right to, to decide about their own lives and bodies. Making assisted suicide legal would give people more control over how they die. These ideas get ignored even with important documents put in place, such as the United Nations Nation's Declaration of Human Rights, which protects basic, basic rights. According to the article Euthanasia, Ethics, and the Law by Smith 2016, not allowing <coughs> assisted suicide takes away freedom and makes people suffer when they don't want to. Smith states that the culture of death is a social ethos that sees value in suffering, promotes the notion that some lives are not worth living, and holds that suicide and euthanasia are appropriate responses to human suffering. So having self-dignity is important and choices between life and death could help society fulfill this desire. Next, dealing with expensive medical bills and ongoing treatments can cause a lot of stress for the families and the patients. Often, caregivers may have to reduce their work hours or even quit their jobs to be with their loved ones. This results in a loss of income. Euthanasia offers a cost-effective solution for end-of-life care because it is a one-time payment. Additionally, in an article by Carter 2016 titled, Why Palliative Care for Children is Preferable to Euthanasia, the author highlights that keeping loved ones in suffering can sometimes be a selfish way of coping rather than truly letting them go. 
Rather, Carter argues that the decision to shorten life is an emotional process that often represents a resolution of an existential crisis and is understood as an act of love and support. So in this case, euthanasia can be seen as a compassionate option for patients facing suffering and would help families come to terms with the reality of their loved one's situation. Overall, it allows individuals to make the difficult decision that their quality of life is no longer worth living weeks, months, or even years ahead. Ultimately, <clears throat> euthanasia is a very difficult subject to evaluate due to its scientific and ethical dilemmas. Our purpose in this presentation was to push through all this controversy and argue that yes, euthanasia should be legal in the United States due to its historical precedent and public support. It is our duty to vote for legislature that will allow euthanasia to be legal in the United States to end the suffering of these patients and to better the lives of generations to come. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Harriet, um, give one specific way your thinking changed as a result of learning about Mandy's findings. Um, my thinking changed a little bit because although it's still in the vein of yes, euthanasia should be legal, um, all my research was based on the scientific lens, which was more focused on the patient, whereas Mandy talked a lot about um, the family, especially in um, her Carter 2016 article, which discussed like the burden on the family of seeing your family members suffer. And so that added like another perspective, which altered my thinking. Okay, thank you. Um, Gage, reflecting on your colleagues' work, which one had the greatest impact on your overall understanding of the problem? I think Reagan's topic of the social death versus biological death had the greatest impact because it made me think more about how these patients aren't only just biologically dying, but they could also be seen with a social death as well, which could make it hard for not just them, but their families as well. So that had a great impact on me. Okay, thanks, Gage. Uh, Reagan, what's a way in which your team's resolution makes you think differently about your own individual work? Um, I didn't feel that our resolution made me feel any different about my individual work, because a lot of the research I did was agreeing that yes, euthanasia should be legal. Um, I just think that we were smart when we were picking which side to be on for our conclusion, and I feel like we did a decent job getting to a deadline. Okay, thank you. Excuse me. Mandy, if you had another team member, what other perspective or limitation <laughs> could they have researched uh, that would have made a useful contribution? Um, I said economical because I was talking financial burdens but I didn't go into like percentages or anything that kind of would maybe make people want to go like either palliative care or euthanasia because like like I said euthanasia is just a one-time cost so I would want to research a little bit more about that. Okay thank you. Another round of applause.